Good evening, everyone. Please direct your attention to the screen. We'll never own up to our past. We'll never build sustainable cities. We'll never set foot on another planet. We'll never stop the overdose crisis. We'll never find a cure for Alzheimer's. We'll never treat each other as equals. We'll never clean up our oceans. But together? Together. We have the potential. We have the potential to shape a different future. Different future. A different future. Welcome to UBC Connects. For today's event, we'll be using a web-based platform called Slido. It lets you ask questions in real time. It works on any mobile device, so take out yours and follow along. We'll show you how to get started. Although we do want you to use your device, please make sure it's on silent as we don't want to interrupt the program. Now once you've confirmed that your device is on silent, pull up your browser and go to slido.com. Now enter the event code UBC Connects. You'll see the hashtag symbol is already populated. All you need to do is enter UBC Connects, all one word. Now you're all set to submit your questions by clicking on the Ask button. Other people can like your question by giving it a thumbs up. When we get to the question and answer part of the program, our moderator will ask the top rated questions first. You can start submitting questions, but they won't be visible until the moderator appears. At that point, you can start voting. Before you go, we have one more thing to ask. We'd like you to take out that mobile device one last time and go to the polling tab. That's where you'll see a few questions about your event experience. Please do take a moment. Your feedback matters to us. Enjoy the program. Please welcome to the stage PhD student in the UBC Faculty of Land and Food Systems, Katie Koroleski. Good evening. My name is Katie Koroleski, and I am a PhD student in the Animal Welfare Program in the Faculty of Land and Food Systems at UBC. I am also the president of the Faculty's Graduate Student Council. It is my pleasure to welcome everyone here this evening. We're thrilled so many of you have joined us here tonight, in the room as well as online, for the fifth installment of the UBC Connect series. In a few minutes, Professor Ono will tell you more about this series. But first and foremost, I would like to acknowledge that we are gathered today on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. You may have noticed a couple of ballot boxes in the lobby before you entered the theater. We are doing a giveaway of two tickets to each UBC's Connects event for Vancouver in 2019. So be sure to enter for a chance to win guaranteed seats at these events. The winner will be drawn tomorrow and contacted by email. Tonight, we will hear Michael Pollan in conversation with two UBC moderators. In the second half of our program, we will continue the discussion with questions for Michael Pollan from the audience. Earlier today, I had the privilege of moderating a student event at UBC with Michael Pollan, where students could ask questions and discuss together. It was a wonderful opportunity and one of the things that Michael discussed that resonated with me is that there are different ways of knowing the world, through science, but also through our experiences. As you just saw, for the audience Q&A, we'll be using an online audience engagement platform called Slido to include everyone in the conversation, even those of you at home can participate. As a reminder, you are able to submit questions now and throughout the first portion of the program, the in conversation, but we're going to hold off on posting the questions that you submit for all to see until the second half of our program. At that time, you will be able to begin voting on all submitted questions. Tonight's program is being live streamed for those who could not be with us in person. In the coming days, an audio podcast, as well as a video of the program, will be posted on the event website at www.ubc.ca slash ubcconnects so you can revisit or also share with friends and family. If you would like to tweet during the program, please use the at UBC and hashtag UBC Connects. 
Now, let's get started. It is my pleasure to tell you a bit about Professor Santa J. Ono before I invite him on the stage to say a few words and introduce our honored guest. Professor Ono earned his BA in Biological Science at the University of Chicago and his PhD in Experimental Medicine at McGill University. His principal research interests focus on the immune system and eye disease. Early in his career, Professor Ono held a variety of teaching, research, and administrative positions at the John Hopkins School of Medicine, Harvard Medical School, University College London, Emory University, and finally at the University of Cincinnati, where he served as president starting in 2012. In 2015, Inside Higher Education named Professor Ono one of America's most notable uni university presidents. He is now the 15th president and vice chancellor of the University of British Columbia and the host of this new public lecture series. Please join me in welcoming Professor Ono to the stage. Good evening, everyone. It's wonderful to see a completely full Orpheum here on this snowy day. Thank you very much uh, for joining us here. Thank you, Katie. Uh, welcome to UBC Connects. It's great to welcome you to the very first UBC Connects uh, seminar, series, seminar of 2019. And I'd like to welcome not only you that are here in this historic venue, but also all of those who are joining us via live stream. For those of you who have been to previous UBC Connects lectures, it is a public lecture series that features the world's most esteemed thought leaders and focuses on pressing global issues. And as you may know, last year's series was sold out. Often these uh, lectures are sold out within an hour after they're announced. So pay attention because I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the uh, lectures that will be in the 2019 series. I'd like to recognize and thank our colleagues at Alumni UBC for their support of the series and the Georgia Strait, our media partner for this event, and the British Columbia Center on Substance Use and the UBC Faculty of Land and Food Systems for their support and sponsorship of tonight's event. We're delighted to have another sold out evening in our largest venue yet, and I am delighted to note that next month, the UBC Connect series is coming to the UBC Okanagan campus in Kelowna. Civil rights activist Tarana Burke will be discussing the hashtag MeToo movement and the role of empathy in healing and change. Don't wait to get your tickets to see our next speaker here in Vancouver, award-winning Nigerian author, Chimamando Ngozi Odichie at the Chan Center for the Performing Arts on March 13th, 2019. You can visit the website ubc.ca backslash UBC Connects for more information on these and future speakers in this series. For those of you who have attended UBC Connects before, tonight's format is a little different. This evening, our speaker, Michael Pollan, will be joined in conversation with two UBC professors. Before I introduce Mr. Pollan, I would like to invite our moderators one at a time to the stage. The first is the beloved Dean of UBC's Faculty of Land and Food Systems in his characteristic shorts, and you'll see that when it comes out. Ricky Yada is a professor and dean. His research focus is in food science, very apropos for today's talk, and he brings broad experience in multidisciplinary settings through his involvement in the networks of excellence in advanced foods and materials network, the International Union of Food Science and Technology, and the Arel Food Institute, as well as being the North American editor for trends in food science and technology. Let's hear it for Dean Yada. You, 
And the second professor that will be joining in this conversation is Dr. Evan Wood. He's the executive director of the British Columbia Center on Substance Use and professor of medicine here in the UBC Faculty of Medicine, where he helps lead the university's efforts in the area of addiction prevention and treatment through his tier one Canada Research Chair in Addiction Medicine. Please welcome Dr. Evan Wood. Now, a few words about uh, Michael Pollan. As many of you know, he's a contributing writer to the New York Times Magazine. He's been doing that since 1987. Michael Pollan has spent the past 30 years as a writer exploring the interactions of humans and nature. He has written a series of influential and award-winning best-selling books, including The Defense of Food, An Eater's Manifesto, and The Omnivore's Dilemma, A Natural History of Four Meals. His latest book, which I know many of you have read, How to Change Your Mind, immediately claimed the very top spot on the New York Times bestseller list when it hit, hit, its, hit the bookshelves last May. Both deeply personal and rigorously science-based, the book is an investigation into the power of psychedelics to treat and comfort those who are struggling with mental illness, terminal disease, and emotional pain. Michael Pollan has also appeared in a number of documentaries, including the Academy Award-nominated Food, Inc. In 2003, he was appointed the John S. and James L. Knight Professor of Journalism at the University of California, Berkeley's Graduate School on Journalism and was appointed the director of the Knight Program in Science and Environmental Journalism. Since 2017, and he still goes back to Berkeley, he has also been professor of the practice of nonfiction at Harvard University in Cambridge, Massachusetts. You're in for a treat. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Michael Pollan as the fifth speaker in UBC Connects. Thank you so much. Thank you for that warm welcome. I feel like the two sides of my brain are represented <laughs> right, in, right here. Well, Michael, you may want to question that given the fact that I'm wearing <laughs> shorts today. So for those, in the, for those in the audience, I'm wearing my winter shorts. I'm not sure if I differentiate between winter and summer shorts, but thank you so much for the comment. Uh, you know, Michael and I had the pleasure of meeting one another when I was back at the University of Guelph, and Michael was brought in to talk about topics that he's written about. And so, Michael, thank you for continuing that journey, and so it's such a pleasure to have you back here at UBC. Thank you, Ricky. And the other thing that I'll just mention to the audience that Michael's familiar with UBC. Uh, probably about 10 years ago, uh, Michael came out to UBC and visited the UBC farm, and many of you in the audience were strong supporters of saving the UBC farm, so thank you very much. So I've invited Michael back during a time where it's a little less snowy to visit us at the farm, but I'll do a bit of self-promotion of the faculty by saying, I think the UBC farm is one of the iconic farms in the world for experiential learning around issues around food security, sustainability, and local foods. And I think these are topics that resonate in Michael's book. So thank you, Michael, for picking up where we left off. So let's start the questioning. And, you know, I had the opportunity to uh, have lunch with Michael, and I said, you know, maybe we'll have a conversation about some of the issues. And so, Michael, I'm going to start off by talking about the food guide. So Canada recently uh, launched its food guide, and many jurisdictions around the world have food guides. But there are challenges with regards to food guides. Many of us who are Canadian were taught about the food guide when we were in elementary school. 
But as adults, we forget some of that. But there's also challenges with regards to accessibility of local foods, pricing of food, and there's those kind of issues. So, Michael, should we have food guides at all? Well, I don't know that we need them. Um, you know, many governments do them, and they do have a way of kind of setting a conversation, and they then influence other policies uh, in turn. So when a school is deciding on uh, their food policies, they might have this authority to refer to. I, th I think we have a tendency to overcomplicate nutrition. Um, you know, for, for one of my books, uh, In Defense of Food, I, I set out to answer a very simple question, which is, what should people eat for their health? And I, and I plowed through uh, nutrition science for um, a couple of years, and, um, and I was uh, embarrassed how simple the answer to that question was. Um, and uh, I gave it away in the very first sentence of this book, uh, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. And that might be all you need to know. Yeah. Now, I've been encouraged to see that the food guide here and, uh, I, and a couple other recent food guides in Brazil and Colombia have uh, changed their, their way of describing food. Um, and they have, instead of speaking in terms of nutrients, uh, which is what many food guides do. You need a certain amount of carbohydrates and protein and fat and more or less of this or that. They're actually talking about food, um, which to the scientist is a kind of vague construct. Um, uh, but to human beings, no problem. Um, and, uh, and so I, it's been interesting to see the conversation shift and that to the extent people can eat real food, and, and by food I mean food such as your grandmother or, or great-grandmother might recognize it, food that uh, is not a product of uh, food science in the last, I don't know, 30 years, um, traditional food, um, that uh, the emphasis is shifting away from the nutrient conversation. And I, I think that's really encouraging, because I, I think one of the most important distinctions in deciding what to eat is um, not so much the nutrient content of the food, but, the, but how it's been prepared and the degree to which it's been processed. And has it been cooked by a human being or an industrial corporation? I mean, that's a key distinction. Um, and, and so we haven't tended to look at food that way. We've had this very much, uh, you know, what I call nutritionism uh, discussion. Um, so I'm, I'm encouraged to see the conversation is moving in more of a, let's talk about food. Um, now, you might think everything is food, everything in the grocery store is food. I, I beg to disagree. Um, I think there is food, and then there are what I call edible food-like substances. <laughs> and so a big part of the challenge in eating is, is distinguishing one from the other. Um, and uh, so I, I've, I've offered various you know, rules to help you do that. Um, but I, I do think, it, um, I think it's a question we over-worry. And I think that the problem with food guides is the industry uh, starts lobbying because they're very afraid that you won't celebrate milk as, you know, divine or something like that, and, or you'll de-emphasize meat. Um, so the industry has more to uh, gain and lose in these food guides than yeah. just about anybody. That was going to be my question in terms of, uh, you know, the pharmaceutical industry and therapeutic guidelines for the treatment of different disorders, it's been well described how the pharmaceutical industry plays a, a very large role in that and how problematic that can be. So, hearing And the talk, food industry does. Yeah, and hearing yeah. you talk about food guides, I'm just thinking to myself, so is that getting corrupted by industry as well? Yeah, the answer is yes. I mean, I can't speak for Canada, yeah. Yeah. but in the United States, uh, that process has been corrupted at various times. We know it. We've seen the, yeah. the emails have been exposed, and um, uh, there's enormous pressure on, on the government when they're writing food guides. And um, the food industry exerts a lot of direct pressure on regulators, um, but they also do it subtly by funding science. Yeah. So there's a lot of corrupt nutrition science. Um, you know, you can go out and get a study proving that Coca-Cola is good for you. Um, there are scientists who will produce that for you, yeah. and if you frame the questions properly. And um, so it's 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 very important to understand that a lot of the nutrition information that is reported in the news is, um, has conflicts of interest of yeah. various kinds. So um, 
I, I'm, I follow that. I'm always interested in new nutrition studies, yeah. but I also think there's a real value for most people who aren't reporting on it to just tune them out. Yeah. It's, a, it's a, just a, hu a huge area. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. It's, yeah. <laughs> Just, just the, the relationship between uh, science and capitalism and how information goes to consumers of knowledge, it's a huge issue. Yeah, it is. And it, it's also, I mean, I'm, you know, nutrients are really important if you want to study food, right, or do food science, sure. right? I mean, you need, you need to kind of be reductive um, in order to figure out what your variables are and, and, uh, and, and, and how food works. Um, but it, you know... That's going on in your car too, right? There's lots of interesting science and engineering in your car, but you don't really need to know it to operate your car. And I think the same is true of nutrition for the, for the consumer. Um, that if you focus on the, at the level of food, um, you know, where else in our lives do we all have, feel we have to walk around with a head full of biochemistry? Yeah. You, know, that, you know, that people know or think they know what antioxidants are. Uh, <laughs> yeah. oligosaccharides, and, and it, it's crazy. I mean, that, that we feel we need an expert vocabulary to do something that our species has been doing for several hundred thousand years. Yeah. So, Michael, let me pick up on the nutrition aspect. Uh, in Canada, uh, the foods are labeled with a nutrition label. So the challenge is, how much information do we put on a label? because there is that element of society that wants to make an informed choice based on composition. Should we have nutrition labels then? Well, ironically, the healthiest food in the supermarket doesn't yeah. have any nutrition yeah. labels. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, I've never thought yeah. of it this way, but maybe yeah. that's a sign for a food you yeah. should avoid, yeah. one that's carrying a nutrition yeah. label. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, because, you know, the... the, the the produce yeah, doesn't yeah, carry them yeah. um, and doesn't much need them. Um, but there are, I mean, I'm being somewhat facetious. Yeah. There's, it, it, I find it useful when I'm shopping. Yeah. Uh, let's say you're buying yogurt, right? Yogurt has become one of the leading delivery systems for sugar, right, in the supermarket. I mean, we all, as parents, we think healthy food to give our yeah. kid. Check out how much sugar is on that. Um, there is more sugar per ounce in some leading brands of yogurt than there is in Coca-Cola, right? More sugar than soda. Um, but the parent still has this association that this is a health food. So being able to know that, oh, 26 grams of sugar in this little six ounce thing of yogurt, right. maybe I won't get that one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> maybe I'll get the one with 14. Sure. Yeah. I think for those kind of purposes, it's really good. Um, we used to, when my son, after a soccer or baseball game, we'd take him to the general store and let him pick out a drink, and we would always put a threshold on it. F see if you can find something to drink with 12 or less sugars. Um, and he got very good at it, and he understood what, you know, where to go to find those rather than the soda aisle. Um, so uh, they have a value, um, and I think a lot of food gets reformulated to stay below certain thresholds so they can appear low fat, but I have to say eating that way with that kind of obsession really gets people into trouble. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, the, the great example is when everybody was obsessing about dietary fat and they were, and as soon as they saw a product that had zero percent fat uh, in it or zero grams of fat in it, they thought this was healthy. Right. Well, that included soda. Yeah. Um, that included lots of, you know, sweet or or just pure refined carbohydrate foods. And in fact, as a culture, we got fat on the low fat craze. Yeah. Um, that should tell you all you need to know. Um, eating you know, by the nutrients is, uh, I think, a loser's game. It also takes the focus off of quantity, which yes. nobody wants to talk about with regard to obesity. That, yeah. that in the end, the kind of food you eat is fine that that has some bearing on it, and there might be reasons to be concerned about carbohydrates, but nobody wants to talk about sheer quantity of food, and that people yeah. are basically eating too much food. Um, and we and we live in a in a, a food environment where food is we're tempted with it uh, all day long, not just by marketing. You can't go to like a, a meeting in a corporation without getting a big tray of bagels and muffins and. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can't go into a store without getting a bowl of candy now. It's really weird. This, yeah. this wasn't the case only like 20 years ago. Yeah. yeah. 
Michael, you know, one of the recurrent themes in, in, I think, all of your books is the systems approach, understanding the systems. And so uh, Michael and I and, and a number of faculty members today had lunch with uh, David Spate, who's yeah. the executive chef for UBC. And I was interested... Oh, thank you. David's out there, so thank you, David. But that wasn't David. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> David, at least you have a couple of fans, right? <laughs> so... You have many fans, David. I'm just pulling your leg. But I was wondering, Michael, you know, in your conversation with David, what lessons did you learn? Well, you know, I've, I've talked to several people over the years who've, who are responsible for feeding yeah. thousands of people, and I, and I know what a challenge it is. And um, uh, one of the things I learned, though, talking to him is how useful it is to have students pressuring him um, uh, and organizing. I, I hope I'm not creating a headache for him, but, yeah. but um, this gives him leverage yeah. when he's talking <laughs> to the people who are writing his budgets. Yeah. Yeah. And um, uh, so one of the things that's happened around the country in the last few years is students on many, many campuses under the auspices often of the, the Real Food Challenge uh, have been organizing to uh, push the food services in a more uh, sustainable direction and a more just direction. Uh, and they've had an enormous influence, um, and I think they have on this campus, uh, which is wonderful to see, and that students have a say. I mean, students are the customers, and, um, that, and they care about, is there local food? Is there humanely raised eggs and meat? Um, uh, what are the labor practices in the, in the suppliers? All these kinds of questions. Um, you know, food is connected to everything. It's the ultimate interdisciplinary topic. And if you push on food, you will find yourself advancing the interests of uh, animals, of farmers, of food workers, of, um, you know, just so many different um, characters in this system. And it's great that individually, we, we're, many of us are changing our food habits, but the next frontier is food service. 50% of the food dollar is, is uh, eaten outside the home, in restaurants and in institutions. And so when we get these large buyers and cookers of food to start paying attention to where their food comes from, and as is happening at UBC, clearly, I mean, there's a lot of attention to sourcing, um, that drives a lot of change. Um, and, you know, one of the... I mean, I've been very struck over the last couple of years is how engaged college students are, and young people in general are, in food issues. Um, and, I've, and I've wondered why, and um, I have a couple theories, but one is, it's not as discouraging as some other issues you can be involved yeah. with. Yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking about climate, um, you know, and that here in food there is something you can do today. You know, you get three votes every day, and we see positive change happening in the food system. Um, we see the rise of organic agriculture. We see the, the renaissance of local agriculture. We see um, pastured livestock, uh, you know, reasserting itself. And, and this has all been driven by enlightened consumers. And, um, and to use the word consumer is to minimize, because they're consumers slash citizens. Many people are making a choice not just based on their own narrow self-interest, mm -hmm what's the cheapest calorie I can buy, but a more citizenly uh, view of that decision, that I'm going to support this kind of agriculture even though this costs a little bit more. For the people who can. Yeah. Not everybody can afford to vote with their fork. Um, and, um, and that's why it's important to vote with our votes also, because policy changes in the end uh, will be needed to codify these kind of changes. You sound optimistic, though. You know, don't yeah. take it too seriously. Because yeah. um, <laughs> I'm not that optimistic. The this, this student piece, I get. Yeah. I think there's... It, you know, there, you, see, you see young people looking at food packaging and environmental issues, and it's connected, and you see young people doing that. But um, whenever I see someone who's very optimistic about these types of things, I tune in because uh, you know, I, am, I gravitate well, to a less optimistic You don't know me well enough. I'm just temperamentally an optimist, yeah. <laughs> so that, that infects my thinking to some extent. Yeah. Um, I mean, no, we have seen some positive change. We have also, uh, 
you know, there's so far we have to go yeah. with the food system. Yeah. But I also see some important drivers that didn't exist 20 or 30 years ago. There, I mean, there are, two, there are two very good reasons to address the food system. And one is public health, obviously, yeah. mm -hmm. that it is the driver of health care costs. It is what kills most of us. You know, yeah. we die from chronic diseases linked to diet, yeah. uh, four of the top ten killers. Um, and if you, if you want to get uh, health care costs under control, you have to address yeah. things like type 2 diabetes, entirely or almost entirely preventable. Yeah. Um, and so there's a strong incentive to address it. Um, that's one thing. And the other, of course, is climate. Um, and I think we're seeing increasingly that the conversation about dealing with climate is extending beyond electricity generation and transportation fuels, fossil fuels, basically, to the recognition that the food system is, uh, is a, a very important driver of, of climate change uh, at many, many different levels. You have um, uh, deforestation and plowing by itself uh, puts tons of carbon in the air, literally. Yeah. You have um, uh, fertilizers, nitrous oxide fertilizers, or ammonium nitrate fertilizers, which produce nitrous oxide, which is a very serious greenhouse gas we don't yeah. talk about very much. Um, and you have uh, animal production um, and methane from cows, and uh, with the result that it's, you know, probably somewhere between 20 and 30 percent of uh, greenhouse gases can be attributed to the food system. But to be optimistic again, slightly, um, the food system, reform in the food system doesn't just have the potential to mitigate this or ameliorate this, mm -hmm. it actually can help roll back climate change. And the reason is that um, soil is one of the great carbon sinks right. that we have. And we now know that, there, that if we farm properly, if we, if we have the proper rotations, and we grow more perennials and less annuals and, and plow less often, that we can draw a lot of carbon back yeah. into the soil. Yeah. So there is, uh, I think there's an un untapped resource there. Um, and that we will, in doing so too, the more carbon that's in the soil, it's, it's really a win-win-win. Uh, the more fertility you have in the soil also, and the better the water holding uh, capacity yeah. of the soil. So I think it's something you can sell farmers on, even farmers who don't believe in climate change, uh, soil health. So um, between those two things, they're just the, re the, the reasons to, to reform the food system are just so compelling. There's a lot to overcome without question. Um, but in the same way, we've made a lot of progress on um, on renewable energy, for example, yeah. um, you know, I, I think we'll look back in 10 or 20 years and, and agriculture will look different and the reason will be climate. Yeah. Okay. And also what's good for the climate in terms of food is good for your diet. There's no trade-off there. It's not a zero sum, right? A plant-based diet, we know, um, uh, based on a diversity of different species is the best thing you can eat and, and that's the best way to, uh, to heal the soil. So, okay. All right, guilty of optimism. <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful I'm to hearing, have I'm hearing both. Yeah. I'm hearing both, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Michael was telling us at lunch, uh, he teaches in... It sounded like I talked the whole time. I didn't really. <laughs> uh, well, it was wonderful to have the conversation at lunch. Uh, Michael teaches at Harvard during the fall, and Michael was indicating that the Harvard students weren't as engaged in the food area as probably the UBC students so, Michael, what's the solution? Do we actually make Harvard a satellite campus of UBC? <laughs> Ship David Spade out there? <laughs> they could use David Spade yeah, out there. Yeah. Um, well, you know, there's... <laughs> you don't want to lose him. Um, there was a... Uh, there's less of a pressure to change the food yeah. system at Harvard. I mean, they have made yeah. some steps in the yeah. right direction. And... Um, but honestly, I think that campuses compete on quality of life for their yeah. students. Um, and Harvard, in its arrogance, uh, doesn't feel it needs to compete for students, yeah. that they'll get whoever they want. Um, and so they have not improved their food service to the extent some other campuses have. But sadly, the students are not pushing them uh, yeah. as much as they might. So I'm trying to stir that up a little bit. Okay, well, thank you. And President Ono, I guess that opens the door for you to actually make Harvard a satellite campus. <laughs> <laughs> so let me get into a transitional question because we'll have some time to talk about issues that you've recently written on. And so 
As I said, Michael, you know, our faculty has the UBC farm. It's 24 hectares, and as I said, it's a wonderful facility to teach students about locality, sustainability, security. And one of the programs that we run caters to residents from the downtown east side. And these are people who largely are experienced poverty, addiction issues, and homelessness. Um, similar to what's reported in your new book, Psychedelics. So do you think there's a potential for collaboration among farm-based programs and psychedelic treatments to enhance the healing and reconnection? Not sure about that. Yeah. Uh, I have to think about that. Yeah. Um, you know, the, uh, I think gardening is incredibly ther therapeutic. Yeah. Uh, farming. I, I think it has enormous potential to heal people. I, I, I've just seen it um, uh, so often. There's a homeless garden project in Santa Cruz, California. That's the most amazing institution where the homeless come and work in this garden and sell food. And to watch the transformation in those lives. Uh, has been really uh, remarkable. Um, to introduce a psychedelic component, well, you're really thinking outside the box. No. Um, <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> um, but I don't want to say anything flip about that before yeah. I've given it a little bit of thought. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I think the transitional object here between these two subjects is the mushroom, right? Yeah. Uh, which is... Uh, <laughs> both uh, a food and a psychedelic. Yeah. yeah. And grows commonly in this area, as I understand. Yeah. A lot. <laughs> a lot. So, Evan, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I am... Uh, we, we talked briefly uh, earlier today, and I mentioned how um, your book, uh, How to Change Your Mind, is, is really, you know, obviously a play on words, and then, and then how people are changing their minds. And one of the things that you talk about, which certainly I see in my world and people coming talking, is how it changes people into true believers and advocates and almost disciples of, you know, the mushroom or these other drugs and how important they are in society. I'm hearing people laughing and knowing some of those people are here. And um, <laughs> just, uh, just a, a question for you, I guess, just to lead off in terms of, you know, it was a, obviously a deeply personal journey. You've, you've delved into this world and it's, it's a world that's happening, in, you know, probably every major city around the world, uh, underground in many ways, and then coming back to life in the research community. And I guess um, people would be really interested to hear just, you know, what was the sort of most profound moment or um, the big takeaway that you had, if anything, in terms of writing the book where there was a time where you said, this is, you know, this is a story to tell. Yeah, uh, I, you know, I didn't, it, it is, uh, well, you, you, there's a few questions in that, buried in that question. One is, the tendency of people involved in this research to become very evangelical about it. Yeah. Um, it's a powerful experience, and many people come out of it uh, convinced that they have found the key to the universe. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so I was intensely aware of that because I'd studied the history, and there's, a, there's, I mean, Timothy Leary is the famous example of somebody like that, but there are many others. And uh, so I, I, you know, tried to guard against that to some extent. I mean, I'm a journalist and, and, uh, and an order of skepticism, I, I, you know, is, 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 is an order. So, um, uh, but it is an occupational hazard of everybody who works with these substances. The, the, substance, the, the, the mushrooms themselves have been very good at recruiting um, the, exactly the kind of people they need to advance their, their efforts to conquer the world. Um, so we should be careful because we can use them, but they can use us too. Yeah. Um, the decision to write a book about this—it uh, was never in my life plan. All right, I had, I, and I, I really didn't have the right preparation. I had never used psychedelics at the age-appropriate time. Um, I had—I uh, knew nothing about brain science, very little about psychology. Um, so it was way out of my comfort zone. Um, I had a long-standing interest, though, in this, uh, just what I was alluding to, this reciprocal relationship between people and plants. Mm -hmm. And I say that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call mushrooms plants, even though I know full well they're fungus, um, but just for the simplicity. Um, and uh, in a book I wrote 
in, 19, in 2001, The Botany of Desire, which was really a, an effort to kind of reconceive this relationship and, and, and kind of demonstrate to people that as much as we might think we manipulate plants, domesticated plants, through breeding and where we choose to plant them and pruning and all this kind of stuff, they're manipulating us too. They, they evolve to get us to do things for them. Yeah. And I looked at, and, and they get ahead to the extent they can gratify human desires. And so you can read our desires in, you know, a, a rose is a very good record of, of human aesthetics, right? It's exactly what we want to see. Um, but, we, but plants evolve to gratify other desires besides beauty and nutrition. And one of them, and the most curious is, the, the human desire to change consciousness, um, which is a very complicated and surprising, in some ways, uh, uh, urge. It appears to be universal. The only um, case, uh, and I'm, I'm citing Andrew Weil here in, in uh, The Natural Mind, which is a very good book about drugs. Um, the, o the only case he could find of a culture that didn't use some plant or fungus to alter consciousness were, were the Inuit in Greenland, I think it was. Um, and the only reason was nothing good grew where they lived. <laughs> and as soon as they relocate to Canada, they, they yeah. get with the program. Um, <laughs> So what is this about? Well, clearly it's about pain relief is one attraction. Um, it's about uh, boredom, I think. Um, the, just simply the desire to vary consciousness and not have the same consciousness all the time. Um, but then how do you explain complicated uh, experiences like psychedelic experience in terms yeah. of, you know, which don't seem to be adaptive on their face, right? They, they, they leave you vulnerable to predation in a natural setting. Uh, in a modern setting, you're liable to walk out in traffic or fall off a building or you know, any number of things. So, so I had that curiosity in the back of my head and I, and I wrote about cannabis and the botany of desire as one of the four plants I looked at there. And then I started reading about um, this trial underway in New York and Johns Hopkins in Baltimore to give um, a single psychedelic session on psilocybin uh, magic mushrooms, to people who had cancer diagnoses, many of them terminal. And in the course of that journey, which is guided, they're with, they're with a, it's very important to make this distinction too, that the way psychedelics are being used in research, they're not simply giving people a pill. They're very carefully supported, they're prepared in advance for what to expect. Uh, somebody sits with them, two people, a man and a woman sit with them the whole time, and then um, you come back for an integration session to try to make sense of this, you know, what can be a very confusing experience. Yeah. Um, and then after a single experience like this, their uh, existential distress, their, their fear and anxiety about the prospect of death or, or recurrence of their cancer, um, in many cases had vanished. And I thought that was so remarkable. And I, I began interviewing some of these people, and their stories were were just incredible, and, um, and that's kind of when I realized there was something here I had to understand, and, I, and that I had to understand in the first person, too. I wanted to understand how you could have such a kind of spiritual shift, and I, I'm not a person who had, had uh, you know, was very spiritual in any way. I mean, I've always thought of myself as kind of spiritually retarded, and um, <laughs> I'm a little better now, um, but... <laughs> So that, that was it. I mean, just to give you an example, I think of this one woman I interviewed. Uh, her name was Dina, and she was, uh, she was 60, and she had had ovarian cancer, and she'd been treated with success, um, but was paralyzed by fear. Yeah. She just, she, she, she just, she was kind of this uh, timid, small woman who um, was a figure skating instructor, and she just was paralyzed. And um, she, she entered into the NYU program and, and had the psilocybin session. And, and during her session, she, uh, as often happens, people with cancer go into their bodies and they have an encounter with their cancer. Yeah. Uh, their cancer. Um, but in her case, she saw a black mass under her rib cage. So she, it wasn't her cancer because it was in the wrong place. Um, but she knew exactly what it was. It was her fear. And she, um, imagine the two guides who are sitting there, she's not saying anything, they're very quiet, and suddenly she says, 
get the fuck out of my body. And they're like, what's going on with her? And, um, and she said at that moment, the fear vanished. And um, later she told me that um, what had happened was the epiphany she had allowed her to distinguish between her cancer, which she couldn't control, and her fear, which she could control. And that insight lifted her fear, and it happened in that one moment. Now, uh, so I wrote in this, I, I wrote an article in The New Yorker about this trial uh, called The Trip Treatment, which you can uh, see on my website if you want. Um, and, uh, and I wrote in the, measly, in, the, in the Weasley way journalists do, I said to get past the fact checkers that you know, her fear was substantially diminished. And, uh, and the New Yorker fact checkers, who are notoriously tough, call her and they read her that, that sentence and say, is this true? And she says, no, he got it wrong. My fear was not diminished, it was eliminated. Mm. Um, so I thought that was quite remarkable. Yeah. And how does that work? Um, what's going on in your mind to allow you to, to not only have the epiphany, but believe it? Yeah. And there's something William James uh, wrote about, about in reference to mystical experience, the noetic quality of the mystical experience, by which he meant, I think he was coining the word, that it has an authority. And this is really key, I think, for the addicts who are able to stop smoking or drinking or taking cocaine, on, and, there, and trials have been done with all three indications yeah. um, on psychedelics, is that, they t that the insight they have into their situation and what's wrong with it um, is very sticky. Um, and that's because of this noetic quality. You, you haven't just heard an opinion or gotten an idea. It's a revealed truth. Yeah. And, um, and I think that's part of what allows people to change. Yeah. yeah, I think that's the biggest mystery in addiction medicine in terms of people talk about that spiritual awakening. And I see them in clinic and I'm looking at them and I'm thinking, you're in remission. Like you're, 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 you probably have the same risk of going back to drinking or whatever it may be as anyone else. And, you know, however yeah. we try through cognitive behavioral therapy and motivational interviewing and all these other techniques to try and bring about that spiritual awakening in people is so difficult. And um, th that's what the research obviously is, is showing. It's, um, yeah, it's well, really Of course, compelling. that's at the basis of AA, yeah. Alcoholics Anonymous, exactly. this mm -hmm. idea that you, uh, you had to have a shift in your understanding of your ego, yourself, yeah. and a higher power. And I always thought that was kind of a Christianity being smuggled into this you know, self-help program, but it's much yeah. more profound than that, actually, yeah. because there is a displacement of the ego that has to happen. Um, and, uh, uh, and of course, the DTs, the whole, the whole theory that people had to go through the DTs, delirium yeah. tremens to get sober, and, and they had a, essentially a conversion experience, but they really had to go through agony first. Yeah. Um, and the original theory, when they started giving LSD to alcoholics in the 50s, because this research has been going on a lot longer than I think most people realize, um, uh, was that oh, the, this, we're simulating the DTs. And yeah. then they talk to people and say, well, actually, it doesn't feel that bad. Um, and so it's something different. But the spiritual component, I think, it's a, it's a kind of spiritual therapy, which I know is anathema to scientists. But um, yeah. uh, the spiritual experience seems to be very central to what happens. And if you can bring that about, yeah. I think we're, we're a little tight for time here, but people will be uh, upset with me if I, if I don't ask you the question. Um, you've, you've probably seen, and I've certainly heard my colleague from the UK, David Nutt, say that you know, the banning of psychedelics was like, uh, if we banned the telescope in astronomy and tried to figure out the universe, and you know, banning psychedelics uh, when was done by government and putting this government to a halt has kind of held us back to this you know, transformative yeah. oh, opportunity. Oh, we've lost 30 years. And, and, and do you think that, that there's that kind of massive incremental gain to be made through, through this research? And well, you know, and, uh, David is drawing on a famous quote by Stanislav Grof, yeah. the psychedelic psychiatrist who did a lot of pioneering work in the 60s and 70s, yeah. and he said that, the, that LSD would be for the study of the mind, what the telescope was for astronomy, yeah. where the microscope was for biology. I mean, a very bold, uh, audacious claim which I thought was insane when I first heard it, frankly. Um, I no longer think it's insane. Yeah, I think it's crazy. still audacious, yeah. but I think there is a lot to be learned. And, and already we're learning it. I mean, these are, 
these are powerful tools, not just of therapy, but to understand consciousness. And um, so I think that they were onto something. And the fact that we banned them uh, and research stopped uh, in the late 60s, early 70s, um, and was only just resumed, um, you know, recently, I, I think, yeah, I, 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 you know, think what we might know now. Um, but fortunately, we're in the midst of this renaissance, yeah, and exactly. uh, it's coming back. And I understand it may be even coming to the UBC campus, which is very Absolutely, exciting. Yeah. And that they're, they're, they're uh, experiments being designed to uh, test psilocybin on, um, on addicts of various kinds and uh, use MDMA yeah. to treat trauma. I think that's all very exciting. You know, there's a lot of questions still to be answered. I mean, we haven't proven the efficacy of these, um, you know, to the satisfaction of, of regulators. And, yeah. um, but I think we will, and I, I don't think it's that far away. Um, and I think within five years or so, this will actually be a tool available to, um, to people working with addicts and people working with the dying and, and the depressed. Um, so that's all very exciting. But, but I'm equally excited by the kind of uh, mind research to be done. Um, there's a lot of work going on in England, especially to, to, take, to scan the brains of people on LSD or psilocybin. And that's already beginning to teach us very interesting things about the self and um, where, where, where that illusion is generated. And, and um, uh, so I think that there's, uh, it, it is a shame that we, we put this tool in, uh, away for, for as long as we did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The biological mechanisms, I think, are going to be really compelling. Um, I, think we, I think we turn over to audience... Uh, participation now, is that correct? So we've got some questions that have come up, so thanks everybody for proposing some questions. Sure. Evan, we have, and Michael, we have a very engaged audience, and so uh, let me ask you this question, Michael. Uh, with real food often costing more and difficult to access for low-income households, how much is food a class issue? Well, food has always been a class issue, and the rich have always been able to afford better food than the poor. This is not news, um, uh, and this will probably be with us for a long time. Um, but I, 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 don't, I disagree with the assumption that real food costs more than um, uh, fake food or edible food-like substances. Processed food is not cheap, um, uh, you know, on the, except on the basis of per calorie. Um, um, when I talk about real food, I'm not saying you've got to buy local and organic. I think that the, the first step is to buy real food. And if it's frozen vegetables or canned vegetables or fresh vegetables, it doesn't really matter that much. I think we fetishize some of these differences. And fresh and local has enormous values, and it's, it's very important for the local farm economy. But um, for your health, just eating vegetables is, is the key. So I think sometimes we complicate it and tell ourselves that, well, this kind of food that people like me are talking about is, is so elite. Not at this level that I'm talking about it. And this is, this is really just um, to eat food that is, um, you know, raw ingredients, minimally processed, cooked by human beings. Now the problem comes in, who has time to cook? Um, and that, I think, is where, part, which is partly a class challenge, because you have many, um, the poor who are working often have the longest commutes and the longest work days, um, and, and also two income earning, although that's kind of general now at this point. Um, and so finding time to cook, uh, which is the best way to ensure a healthy diet in my view, um, whatever you cook, if you're cooking, you will be eating better than someone buying processed food or restaurant food, or fast food, certainly. Um, so. It's the time cost of food, not, the, not necessarily the, the store cost of food, that gets us into that, that difficulty. Uh, and, and of course, they're, they're, I mean, so you can't solve food without solving for the whole economy, you know, finally. I mean, you, you want to create a world where people don't have to work too long, that they can't get home in time to cook a meal. You want to create a world where everybody can afford organic food. Um, but that's going to that's going to involve changing a lot of different things. But at this basic level, um, there are plenty of real foods that can be cooked very simply in 15, 20 minutes. 
And I think part of our problem is we have complicated cooking in our culture. Um, we've turned cooking into a spectator sport you watch on television. And that kind of cooking is very intimidating. Um, you know, you know th these guys and, and, and women with the, the knives flashing and going so fast, you'd cut your fingers off and, and fountains of flame and, and there's a clock ticking down. And that's not really cooking, that's yeah. something else. Um, and it, you know, the goal of television is always the same, which is to pin you to the couch and make you watch more television, right? Yeah. And cooking shows definitely do that. And um, so I think we've overcomplicated cooking and that they're very simple things to cook that you can do in 15, 20 minutes that everybody should be able to do. Um, so anyway, I, yeah, there's a class element, but sometimes that is used to um, uh, just say, I can't do it. Um, and I, you know, I think that we're going to have to fix our diet before we can fix the whole economy. Well, too bad David's not up here. Uh, you know, I'm not working for David, by the way. Oh, I'm a big fan of David. But, you know, I think David's philosophy, David, I hope I'm not getting this wrong, is there's beauty and simplicity. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, certainly the yeah. better, you know, the fresher the ingredients, the yeah. less technique you need. Yeah. I mean, that was Alice Waters' great teaching, yeah. right? I mean, that, that great cooking begins with great farming. And when the farmers do a good job, uh, the cook doesn't have to do much work. Uh, you can simply, you know, put those vegetables on a sheet, sheet pan, spray them with olive oil, a little salt and pepper, and roast them, and you're good to go. Um, that doesn't take a lot of skill or a lot of time. Well, thank you, Michael. Evan? Uh, the next question here is about um, microdosing and then uh, benefits with cognition and creativity. And obviously, in the information technology sector, that's you know taken off. And yeah, where so I live, place. everybody's microdosing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so microdosing is the taking of uh, a, a tenth of a normal dose of LSD or psilocybin, usually once every three or four days. Um, it's supposed to be subperceptual, um, so you're not you're not noticing any changes in perception. Supposedly, you can go to work, you can drive your car, and all this kind of stuff. And it, it's supposed to function as kind of a brain vitamin. Um, there's no evidence, there's no scientific evidence that it works um, yet. Um, there hasn't been a lot of research. There, uh, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence, um, but I think we have to be really alert to the fact that, especially when it comes to psychedelics, the placebo effect is incredibly Tremendous. powerful. Yeah. Um, there's such a mystique around these molecules that um, uh, people, you know, attribute lots of changes that may, may not all belong to the molecule. Um, and so I await, you know, more evidence. There is a company that recently completed a microdosing trial, but they haven't published the results yet in England. Um, so I'm really curious about that. Um, I know lots of people who swear by it, um, whether to relieve depression or anxiety or uh, enhance creativity um, or... Um, uh, productivity. Um, the whole idea I, I, I kind of chuckle at, I mean, here are these drugs that are so powerfully transformative and disruptive, um, and indeed disrupted our society in the 1960s in ways you can decide are good or bad. I mean, I, I tend to think on balance it was actually good. Um, and here we're turning them into another productivity drug. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, if you want to reconcile capitalism to uh, psychedelics, microdosing is the ticket. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think it, it is the one area that, you know, there just isn't the research there. And I think if there was any, it, it very much lends itself to a placebo-controlled trial because yeah. you, you won't know. And I think if there's anywhere that there might be a disappointment in this area of research for advocates is that the microdosing piece where um, it may be uh, not the same as, uh, as actually yeah. having that profound mystical experience and having it uh, make changes, but um, we could yeah. be proven wrong. Well, I, you know, I, I, and I would you know, be happy to be proven wrong about it, but um, uh, so we should know pretty soon, um, but I didn't spend a lot of time on it in the book, because in the book I really did want to stick to the things that we had some you know, real body of research to yeah. support. Um, so I, I didn't give them. And there's a very good book about microdosing that came out last two years ago by Ayala Waldman called A Really Good Day. So I figured, okay, that's her. She's got that. 
Yeah. <laughs> Great. Michael, um, if you could change one dietary practice to the world's population overnight, what would that change be and why? My head hurts from going back and forth. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, it would be to reduce meat consumption. Yeah. Uh, I think that um, <laughs> as much as I love to eat beef, um, uh, you know, um, as somebody put it to me recently, cows are the new coal. And um, uh, there, we simply cannot uh, continue down this path. Um, uh, Cattle, both for dairy and for meat, contribute mightily to climate change. And you can mitigate it to some extent by the way you grow them and whether they're on grass or you know, on corn. Um, but uh, I think it was the World Watch Institute a couple years ago um, did a study that if the population of China decided to eat meat at the rates that North Americans do, which is nine ounces per person per day, I mean, more than half a pound, right? I mean, think about it. We're eating meat three meals a day, many of us. Um, if China chose to do that, we'd have to have 2.3 more worlds to grow all the grain you would need to feed all those animals. Um, simply can't do that. Um, so those of us in the, in the developed world who are eating that kind of levels of meat need to eat less. Um, and, and the shift to a plant-based diet or a more plant-based diet is really imperative. So, yeah, that would be, the, the, I think, the first change that I would uh, legislate if I could. Great. Thank you. Evan? The thing I think that brings these conversations together a little bit is what um, you know, people that have done LSD you know, tell me is the one thing that you commonly hear is that if people realize that everything is connected. Yes. And, you know, every, I realized the roots went down and they came up over there and I was connected to that animal or that person. And, and, it's, um, you know, and it's true. <laughs> everything is connected. Yeah. And, and the connect, one connection, too, an important connection, at least in terms of how I think about it, is health. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of my work about food was looking at environmental health, health yeah. of the body, and this new work is about mental health. Yeah. And as you well know, mental health and physical health are closely totally connected. So. Yeah, absolutely. The, the next question um, was about bad trips and just sort of, uh, what about bad trips? Uh, and, uh, Do you want me to tell you one? Because <laughs> I had one. Um, well, bad trips are real. Um, bad trips happen, and I mean, we, I, I'm glad you brought up risk, because I, I think it's very important to talk about risk, and yeah. it's very hard for people to listen to someone talking casually about psychedelics and therapy yeah. without, like, wait, well, don't people stare at the sun till they go blind, and doesn't it scramble your chromosomes, which were stories I heard growing up and believed. Um, so risk, there, there, there are three ways, three dimensions to it. One is, so the classic psychedelics, LSD, psilocybin, DMT, are um, remarkably non-toxic. Yeah. Um, that there are many drugs in your medicine cabinet that are more toxic, that you bought over the counter. Things like Tylenol yeah. compared to LSD, which is, I was amazed at this fact. There's no lethal dose that has been found. Um, uh, and they're non-addictive. Uh, they're not habit forming. Um, your first thought after a, a, a major psychedelic experience is, I've got to do that again. No. That's not your thought. It's, do I ever have to do that again? Um, but there are psychological risks. And uh, the bad trip can lead to uh, panic attacks, and does. Um, those panic, panic attacks are sometimes misdiagnosed by psychiatrists as psychotic breaks, or were yeah. in the 60s. Yeah. But there have been psychotic breaks on psychedelics. This does happen. Would people have had them anyway? Probably. These are people yeah. at risk for schizophrenia. Yeah. Um, but the bad trip is real. Um, I think in, it's often a product of um, bad set and setting. I mean, these were the terms that Leary invented, uh, came up with, um, which is to say that unlike many other drug experiences, what happens on a psychedelic is, is incredibly variable. Um, you know, cocaine or opiates, you can kind of predict the phenomenology and it will be pretty consistent over large groups of people, but not so with um, psychedelics. And they're very much the product of the set, which is to say your mindset, and the setting, the, the environment in which you're in. And so if you're not in a safe place, 
uh, and you don't feel that you're uh, in a safe place, you're, when you, if you take a big dose and you start feeling the dissolution of your sense of self and your ego bursts into flames um, or whatever, um, that can be terrifying. Yeah. You will struggle to hold on to it. Yeah. Um, you will not be able to surrender it. Um, and that's, that can be the difference between a good trip and a bad trip. The ability to surrender, I think, is the most important predictor of a good trip. Um, and, uh, uh, it, you know, based on my own experience and the, and the guides I've talked to, and, that, and that's a big part of what the preparation is. Yeah. So um, uh, it's very interesting, too, what, it, what do we mean by bad trip? Mm. In, a, in a clinical situation, when you're with a guide who is experienced, they, they won't use the term bad trip. They'll right. say a challenging trip. Yeah. Um, because very often, that horrific imagery you saw or that re-experiencing of childhood trauma, um, therapeutically, is incredibly productive. Yeah. Um, if you can integrate it and process it. If you have that experience and you're at a concert and you're getting in touch with some childhood trauma, yeah, that's, that's not going to be yeah. pretty. Um, yeah. And, and that's, a, that's a strong argument for doing psychedelics in this container of, yeah. of the guide. Um, but um, I, I think that's reassuring for people conducting the research to be able to tell people that, you know, you may have a challenging experience, but the research does show, and I'm sure you learned yeah. that from the Hopkins group, that the depth of the, the mystical yeah. experience is actually those people tend to do better. Yeah. So um, if you can tell people that first, that, um, yeah, that you know, there's you, a value, just, you know, you have an easy no time pain, and no it's game. no problem. Yeah. yeah, it seems like that, at least with psilocybin, that uh, the depth of that experience yeah, is Yeah, I mean, really many impactful. people have, I mean, when, when you actually are talking about specific trips, bad is just not a very useful adjective. Yeah. Because there are periods, and even a, what I remember as a very um, a positive trip, that were scary, terrifying yeah. even. Um, you know, lots of death imagery and... Um, and this sense of ego dissolution, all these things. Um, that's why you need help yeah. <laughs> to go through them. Um, they are, you know, kind of rites of passage, and rites of passage have very difficult uh, parts. Yeah, exactly. uh, if it was easy, it wouldn't, it wouldn't count for as much. Yeah, those profound changes. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, Michael, I love this question. When no one is looking, maybe they are looking, What's your go-to like? snack? <laughs> <laughs> well, if I'm on a long road trip and I stop at a gas station and I know I have a food rule, don't get your fuel the same place your car does. <laughs> um, it will be a bag of Cracker Jacks that I will buy. That is my favorite junk food. Um, it's not as good as it used to be. There used to be more nuts. Yeah. <laughs> and I like the little box. Um, and the prizes suck at this point. Uh -huh. um, they're like decals because yeah. of choking worries, you know. Yeah. Um, not that they were ever that good. So, yeah, that, that, that would be it. Yeah. In, in, at home, where I don't keep a stash of Cracker Jacks, um, I, I snack on nuts and dried fruit. Okay. Can we get Michael a big box of Cracker Jacks <laughs> with a decent price? I was disappointed there were yeah, no Cracker Jacks yeah, in the green yeah, room, actually. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, that used to be my favorite, Michael, but I'll tell you the driver was the prize inside. <laughs> <laughs> Evan, over to you. Uh, and the next question is, uh, I think, a little bit of a, a tough one, maybe, but it's about um, sort of the underground... Uh, marketplace where people can go and do this and you know I yeah. see it described as quasi legal in other cases no, it's, it's illegal, illegal. <laughs> yeah. let's, let's um, be clear it's and illegal. Uh, it, the question is any any advice uh, you know for for people uh, that are looking for this type of thing <laughs> um, you know I have been asked so in for for the book in case you haven't read or read, read about it. Um, I, I wanted to have the kinds of experiences that the, that the people in the clinical trials were having. I could not get into those trials for various reasons. And um, so I had to go into the, into the, the underground. Yeah. And there is a, uh, a network that's surprisingly um, uh, 
coherent, well-organized, um, consistent of people um, who are, in many cases, uh, trained therapists, um, some of them MDs, some of them uh, psychologists, who are so convinced of the value of psychedelic therapy that, that they are willing to risk their license, their, their livelihood, and their freedom yeah. to administer it to people. Um, there is, uh, and I, I met a bunch of them. I interviewed them. I was very nervous about this. I was a very reluctant psychonaut. And so, um, and I met people I would not entrust my mind to. Um, and, but I finally found people I felt really, it's like interviewing a shrink. You have to have a, a, a fundamental sense of trust and confidence. And um, so how do you find them? Um, you know, I've been asked literally hundreds of times for referrals since the book came out. It's been one of the most difficult things about the, the whole process because many of the people coming to me are really suffering. Um, or they know someone. They have a son who's suicidal or, or the, a spouse that is an alcoholic and, or someone who's dying and this, maybe this will help. And, and I can't make referrals. Uh, it was just too dangerous um, to the guides. Um, uh, so I've been, and I've kind of kept my distance from the guides I work with because I don't, I don't want to get them. I don't want to jeopardize them. But I did, uh, on my website, there's a resources section and I have a lot of uh, resources that might help you um, find people. They're, they're in a community like this, you would find people. I'm sure they're people. Um, I was just in um, Medellin, uh, Colombia last week, and I, I was, somebody was asking me, so are there psychedelic therapists in Medellin? I was like, I don't know. And then one came up and introduced him to me, to himself yeah. to me. Um, and there are. Um, yeah. So they're around. I think you have to ask around. You have to ask friends. You have to do um, uh, you know, your due diligence, interview people, um, and make sure that uh, you have a good feeling about them. Um, but the, the psychedelic therapists in, that I've met you know, have a code of conduct that they all... Um, honor. Many of them have a sliding scale. Um, they're very ethical people. Um, they take medical questionnaires in advance. They disqualify you if you're taking certain meds that yeah. are counterindicated. So it was, a, I was surprised. It, you know, it's a more serious bunch of people than I thought. My concern, though, is um, in making some kind of blanket statement about them is that I think they're going to, the demand is going to be such uh, for psychedelic therapy. Uh, because of people reading about the research, people reading my book, uh, the conversation going on in the culture, that there will be a lot of charlatans getting into this field. Right. And that people need to be particularly careful. Uh, how much experience does someone have? Who did they train with? Because many of them are actually getting trained in above ground uh, programs. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and be careful. Because there's a... There, there are risks here. I mean, and there's, there, there's a risk of sexual abuse in that relationship, I think, um, especially with MDMA therapy. Um, so, I, I, you know, I don't want to be overly evangelical about it. Right. Yeah, no, I think that's really thoughtful. Yeah. yeah. Evan, I see that we're probably running short of time. We could be here for a couple hours, I think. Yeah. So I'll turn it back over to you for concluding comments, I guess. I think for fairness and interest, I think there's time for one more oh, question. Okay. So if you have one there, sure. I see the, the screen is full here, so we're not going to get to them all. So Let's, Can we do a psychedelic question for the last one? Would that be all right with you guys? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, shall I take that? Oh, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Um, yeah, well, sorry to put you on the spot, no, but I just no. wanted a little fairness. But... Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess the question that I'm seeing and, and I think is in a lot of people's minds is, you know, what's the barrier? What, what, what needs to be overcome to, to bring this about? And I, I kind of have my own answer to that question from my observations, but I'm really curious yeah. to hear yours. Well, there's a couple things. Um, education, obviously. Um, there are people, you know, psychedelics are still stuck in the 60s, um, which is when most people think they began. Yeah. And... Um, uh, and they acquired a reputation in the 60s that they're still stuck with. There's a, they're, they're, one of the reasons that the, the researchers that you, know, you presumably will work with psilocybin and not LSD is it's less controversial because yeah. less politicians have ever heard of it. Um, so there is still a danger of a backlash. Um, 
And so I think educating people about the, the, ri the real risks and, and the real rewards. Um, and so we can kind of just kind of normalize them, that they're tools. They're not, um, they're tools. And, and like all tools, they have their benefits and they have their place. And, and maybe they have, you know, risks too. But is it worth, is it, worth it? Um, the other thing is, though, uh, finishing this research, you know, taking this through, the, um, figuring out what are the best indications yeah. um, to use them on, and doing uh, the research so far has really been small groups. I mean, you know, a phase two study might have uh, 40 people in it, um, and we need to trial it on hundreds of people, um, and we need to figure out, there's still a lot we need to learn, um, and... Uh, uh, so I think that's the, I, I think they'll t if, if the research can be done and it can be funded, and that's another hurdle because yeah. governments, I don't know about Canada, um, but in America, in the United States, the government is not yeah. funding this and probably won't fund it. There's very little money for mental health funding. Um, maybe under the opiate crisis there might be some money, but, but basically it's all been privately funded. Yeah. And that's really important that that private money step up to do this because the government won't do it. Um, so that's another hurdle. In the United States so far, the money has stepped up. Um, a lot of people in Silicon Valley have made big contributions very quietly to this research um, because they believe in it. They've had their own experiences. Um, and um, uh, yeah, I think, so I think, you know, I think it's, it's money and, and, and finishing the research project. Yeah, that, that, that was my observation from my international colleagues and uh, and certainly from the book is the you know in the IT sector and I think in micro dosing and people kind of being turned on to this but uh, it's just very unique in that um, you look at the US National Institute on Drug Abuse in the States the potential that we're all talking about here today the opioid crisis their budget is about four billion dollars annually yeah. and they're not going near this. And it gets yeah. back to the stigma like you're talking about and really the need for the philanthropic community to step up to see this through. Yeah. yeah. But there are also, there are leaders in psychiatry that are, are um, more open to this than I expected. I, I thought there'd be a lot of resistance in the psychiatric establishment. And in fact, with this New Yorker article, I'll end on this story, um, uh, my, the editor of the New Yorker, I handed in this piece, and it was a very positive piece about psychedelic therapy for the dying. And... Uh, I got a call from my editor um, uh, like three days before it's closing and going off to the printer saying, um, look, we really need a quote, uh, you know, from somebody, a big shot, who thinks this is all bullshit. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, so um, who can I call? And the first person I thought of that would have the standing and I thought would be critical was uh, a man named Tom Insel, who was at the time head of the National Institute of Mental Health in the United States. I reach him in Davos, uh, of course, and, um, and I tell him what I'm writing about and what this piece is about, and you know, I'm waiting for that quote of, this is irresponsible, this is a drug of abuse. Yeah. And no, he says, no, this, in, this research is really important. We need this. Um, <laughs> I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> it's not what I wanted to hear. Um, but he explained to me something I didn't understand because I'd never written about this, this area, you know, about mental health, which is that... Um, Mental health is broken. The system yeah. is broken. If you compare mental health care to any other branch of medicine, whether you're talking about uh, cardiology or oncology or infectious disease, there's been very little progress. Yeah. All those other branches of medicine have saved millions of lives, reduced suffering dramatically, and you cannot say that uh, across the board about mental health care. Yeah. And, You know, the last big period of innovation was the, the antidepressants, SSRIs, right, which is the late 80s, early 90s, and um, very little since then has happened. And the SSRIs are, don't do it for lots of people, and people don't like taking them. And yeah. so the need for innovation, and this is part of what engages the Silicon Valley community too, um, there is a desperation in the field that I hadn't detected, and, and that gives me hope that they will listen and uh, if it proves out, if the science, if the evidence is there, that they will embrace it. Yeah. So yeah. I'm encouraged, I'm optimistic. Yeah, good. <laughs> good. So um, just before we say thanks, a couple of uh, housekeeping items. Um, you'll be heading up to, uh, to the lobby 
to sign some books. Um, I've been asked to, uh, to say, please uh, have your book ready. If you want to take a photo, it's got to be really quick and uh, probably not time for sort of personal uh, uh, reflections and comments in, in people's books for them, unfortunately. Um, as you heard at the beginning, um, if, uh, if people can open the, um, their Slido app on their mobile device and complete the polling, um, it really helps to improve these events. And, um, and really just, uh, just to thank you. Um, I think you know, we're, um, we're facing such tremendous challenges in our society. I think uh, we're just gonna look like cave people uh, at how we ate and how we treated the <laughs> earth and, um, and treat, how we treated mental health and addiction. And um, I think in particular with uh, psychedelics in terms of uh, the missed opportunity and hopefully your book will help us realize our folly and move on to a, web, uh, a better way of being. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Evan. Yeah. Thank you, Ricky. Thank you for your questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Wonderful. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. I'll see you outside. The people can head on out. Ah,